Okay, so let's continue from the previous video, a hierarchical policy model for microsegmentation in Kubernetes. Now, in the previous video, we looked at defining the Kubernetes security domains for your cluster. And for those domains, we then went about defining the policy tiers and placing policies for the respective domains in their respective tiers and looked at how you could then delegate policy deployment and authoring capabilities to other personas in the organization. And then for each domain, we defined what the security policy standards would be. And these are the type of policies that you would implement for each of the domains. Now, just a reminder that this is a model. You can pick and choose what the domains are for your cluster. You can kind of pick and choose the tiers that you want to implement. It doesn't necessarily have to be what I'm presenting here, uh, so long as it conforms to a kind of defined model for your organization, okay? All right, so next up, we're gonna continue with security policy standards and look at a YAML template and what the policy representation would be for each of the domains uh, and each of uh, and the types of policies we identify for each of those domains okay now the reason you want to develop such a standard is because if you look at calico's policy definition in calico's docs what you're going to realize is that a policy tends to be quite extensive, it's quite powerful, it's quite flexible. You can think of any scenario and arrive at a policy for it. You can get creative in the way you define your policies, right? And that is something you want to control, so to speak. You don't want a user to go about defining policies as they see fit because different users would come at it in different ways. Rather, you want to tell them what your standards are, what your templates are for each type of policy and make sure that all of your users, be they your platform team, your security team, and your developers, develop policies in a way that it conforms to the standards that you've identified, right? And these are representations of what those YAML definitions could look like for your environment. So long as a user sticks to a standard, the policy is easy to understand. You know exactly what the user is doing with the policy. And it makes scaling and day two operations that much simpler. Okay. All right. So let's look at the standards one by one. So if you look at a cluster wide policy, this is what the representation of that policy looks like. So you have all of your cluster workloads and you can apply a policy cluster wide to, as an example, in this case, deny access to IP addresses based on a threat feed. Some other examples could be, let's say, denying access to certain internal networks, right? Um, you could, let's say, for example, deny access to the internet. If this is a private cluster in your environment, and you want to make sure that these workloads don't have access to the internet, you could do so using a cluster-wide policy, right? And this is what the representation of that policy looks like. All right, so next up, we look at a tenant isolation policy. And the idea behind this is for an identified tenant, and remember, a tenant could be a customer, a business unit, it could be an environment in your cluster, it could even be a collection of sensitive workloads. Let's say your environment has certain workloads that process personally identifiable information, right? And these workloads could be scattered across different namespaces. You could use a tag to identify those workloads and group them into a tenant and make sure that other workloads in the cluster, let's say, are not able to talk to these workloads unless explicitly permitted by a policy. So you could have a high level guardrail that either denies that or passes that traffic based on certain conditions that you specify, okay? So in this example, you know, I have a tenant here and, you know, I've shown a, a representation where we are preventing this tenant from talking to uh, 
other tenant workloads or preventing other tenant workloads from you know, talking to uh, workloads in tenant one. Again, okay, this is what the policy representation looks like for tenant isolation policies. Okay. All right, next up, platform policies. Now, remember when we spoke about platform policies, these are policies that apply to your Kubernetes control plane, right? For example, um, it could be the Kube API, it could even be things like Kube DNS. Uh, this could also be policies that apply to certain uh, networking components of the cluster, such as an ingress controller. And typically, if you look at an ingress controller, it accepts traffic from sources outside the cluster, it could be consumers and other systems outside the cluster, and then forwards that traffic to a workloads backing a certain service, right? So if you look at an ingress control, it typically has to talk to maybe all the namespaces in the cluster or certain workloads in the cluster. And the representation of a policy for that you know, looks like this, where you have a certain platform component like I said, an ingress, cube DNS, it could be cube API if your workloads are communicating with the API, uh, maybe certain logging and metrics gathering solutions. So these components will have to talk to uh, maybe a subset or all the other workloads in your cluster. And maybe you want to permit that using a policy at a global level. And this is what the representation looks like. And um, if you recall, the platform-specific policies, you know, sit in, uh, you know, a, a special tier. It's called the platform tier, and the reason we do so is because once you define this for one environment, it's essentially the same set of policies for all your environments, given that your platform components are the same, right? So you define these policies, and it could be part of your platform spin-up or setup bootstrap going forward you know you could just incorporate these policies as your you know platform comes up that way you're spinning up platforms and hardening those from the get-go okay all right next up is a namespace isolation policy and the idea behind this is to apply a policy that isolates a namespace from other namespaces in the cluster and the way this works is you can create a policy in such a way that workloads inside a given namespace can freely talk to each other, right? So you are, so to speak, in, you're not too worried about what's inside the namespace, right? But, but you want to establish a perimeter, you know, around a namespace. And then using the policy, you can permit uh, what gets in and out of the namespace within the cluster and also what gets out of the namespace uh, if these workloads are connecting to external services outside the cluster, right? And this is what the policy representation for that looks like, okay? All right, yeah, next up is a workload isolation policy. And a workload isolation policy creates a perimeter around a workload. Now, in Kubernetes, a workload is typically a pod, which is the atomic unit for a workload in a Kubernetes cluster. And there are high-level constructs in Kubernetes that kind of govern how workloads are deployed in the cluster, right? Um, these constructs, for example, are deployments. There could be stateful sets, you know, daemon sets, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and end of the day, these constructs, they translate to pods in the cluster. And when we look at a workload isolation policy, the policy itself applies to uh, the pods, uh, but it's it's applied at a construct level, right? So let's say you have a deployment with 10 pods, as an example. You deploy a single policy to protect that entire deployment. Under the hood, Calico will apply the policy to all the 10 pods, but you're applying it at an abstracted level. And the idea behind this is to create a perimeter for the workload. And if you recall the example, inside the namespace, inside a given namespace, you could have a certain workloads that require special treatment. This could be sensitive workloads, maybe workloads facing consumers, uh, 
um, maybe workloads, let's say receiving traffic from an ingress and because they are receiving traffic from an outside source through the ingress, you may want to create a perimeter around that workload. And the idea behind that is if this workload were to get compromised, um, there should be some control over how uh, a malicious actor could laterally move within the same namespace, right? So by creating that perimeter, you um, ensure that that workload has least privilege when it comes to its ability to connect to other workloads even inside the same namespace, okay? So if you look at the representation, you can permit what other workloads this workload can talk to, you know, even inside, let's say, the same namespace. And you can also control external services that the workload can communicate with um, at a workload level. Now, you could even do this in a namespace isolation policy. When you create the rules for this policy, you could even within the same namespace, like target specific uh, workloads and authorize different workloads in the same namespace to communicate with different services, right? But as you think about a namespace isolation policy and a workload isolation policy, if your requirement is to create a guardrail around the namespace, go with a namespace isolation policy, right? That, that would be adequate for most cases, but if you think like you need a guardrail uh, at a deployment level, you know, and, and this could be applicable to kind of financial services, kind of e-commerce type platforms that, you know, has to kind of comply with PCI uh, uh, requirements, then look at a policy, you know, at a, at a workload level, right? And finally, we have the default deny policy. And the idea behind this is to deny all flows not explicitly permitted by previous policies. And if you recall, I mean, the example, the representation I've given here is all cluster workloads. You can have a default deny policy that applies to all the cluster workloads. And the idea behind this is once you have this in place, your cluster has what we call a default deny posture. And what that means is if someone deploys new workloads to the cluster, they will not be able to communicate with any other workloads in the cluster unless you have some sort of policy that permits that. Okay. Now, there's a slight kind of exception to this in that when you define a platform policy, um, you define it at a cluster level. Uh, so for example, if you create a policy that permits all the workloads to communicate with platform components, that would apply to, depending on how you create the policy, even to new workloads in the cluster. And there are certain scenarios in which you want to do that, right? So let's say, in general, you want all workloads to be able to communicate with cube DNS for DNS resolution, right? So you define the policy in a way that this would apply to not just existing workloads, but even new workloads in the cluster. Okay. However, if you look at something like a namespace isolation policy, you may only want to define that at deploy time, right? So when you're deploying a new namespace, a new application, that's when that policy is defined. So if someone, let's say in an environment that has a default deny deploys a new namespace and workloads for that namespace, the default deny by default is going to deny all traffic for those workloads unless you accompany that by uh, the policy that, let's say, permits traffic inside the namespace and traffic in and out of the namespace, so to speak. Okay. So the idea behind the default deny is to create that posture in your cluster because the default behavior in a Kubernetes class is to allow all traffic, right? So the, what the default deny does is it kind of flips that around and denies all traffic by default unless permitted by a policy. Now, we previously spoke that you could have stacked default deny policy. So you could have a default deny policy, let's say, at a tenant level, even at a namespace level if you want to do that, or at a global level, right? What this does is uh, it kind of gives you more control over certain domains in the cluster, especially if they're managed by 
kind of different teams. Maybe different teams need to have control over um, you know, what they deny for their respective domains, right? Um, so that option is also um, available. You know, sometimes teams uh, or customers, they deploy a default deny just for the pat platform, the control plane, right? Because um, maybe they want to take certain liberties when it comes to what they want to define at the control plane level, and they may define a separate default deny for application workloads, right? Uh, some customers tend to do it at a tenant level, you know. So it's up to you as to how you want to structure that. All right, so this is the model, right? Um, you know, we've not looked at actual policy or YAML definitions. We'll look at that in a separate video. But the idea behind presenting this model is so that you have something to refer back to, you have the blueprint, so to speak, for what your policies would look like in a cluster. And that is essential. You need to have that foundation before you go about deploying policies you know, to be successful in uh, the long run. Okay. Now, before I close, uh, I just want to highlight a few things. It's not a must that you have all of these templates and your templates could even differ based on your requirements. These are the most common templates we've seen out there. I mean, these templates are adequate, I would say, for the majority of customer requirements. And you kind of get to pick and choose, you know, like I said, maybe you start with cluster wide policies, platform policies and namespace isolation policies with a you know, default deny. Maybe that is adequate for your requirements. So think about what you need um, to achieve your security objectives. Um, you can still have the tiers if you think uh, a requirement could arise in the future. You know, there's no harm in, let's say, having the workload isolation tier and keeping it blank, right? That way you create the structure and you also have kind of, so to speak, planned for the future. Uh, and if the need arises, you could accommodate such requirements okay and, and and kind of one more thing uh, that I want to mention is once you define the standards I mean what this typically looks like is and, and let me kind of give you some examples here so if you look at cluster-wide policies you identify your cluster-wide controls and it would be a cluster-wide policy per control and a control for example would be deny traffic to the internet a policy for that deny traffic to let's say your production networks you know would have a policy for that right so it's a policy per cluster wide control that you intend to deploy if you have tenant isolation policies it's going to be a policy per tenant right let's say you have 10 customers in a cluster a policy per tenant and in each of those policies you define what you want to control if you look at platform policies identify your platform components you know cube dns Ingress, Prometheus, just list down the platform components and it's going to be a policy kind of per platform component, right? And if you look at namespace isolation policies, let's say if you have 100 namespaces in your class, it's going to be a policy per namespace or 100 policies, right? Don't worry about the number of policies there, so long as you have that correlation between the policy and the control, okay? because the number doesn't really matter. I mean, as you scale, your policies have to scale uh, as well. And having a policy per name, so long as the one-to-one -one correlation is perfectly fine, right? And let's say if you want to develop workload isolation policies, let's say you want to develop these policies for 100 different type of workloads in your cluster, it's 100 policies, 100 workload isolation policies. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm talking at large scales here. Uh, I mean, we've seen customers scale up to thousands of workloads. Uh, it all depends on your environment. But so long as you have that correlation, the number doesn't really matter. Okay. So once you have uh, this defined, um, you can come up with certain other strategies. It could be labeling strategies, uh, ordering strategies, strategies, you could assign each standard here a specific order. And the idea behind that is you could just go into any cluster 
and kind of look at any policy and have an understanding of what that policy is meant to do, right? And this makes, like I said, scaling, troubleshooting, performance-wise, you know, um, it, it's performant because you don't have policies that uh, are overly um, either permissive or overly kind of restrictive that consumes a lot of resources in the cluster, right? So it's, it's performant. It makes day two operations that much simpler, okay? All righty, so this is the policy model. I, I hope uh, this is you know beneficial and I hope that this gives you the necessary foundation to um, you know implement micro segmentation in your environments. Um, and you know, that's pretty much it for, for this uh, video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.